I'm beginning to hear a little sound coming out of Lincoln. A little more chatter than we thought as of yesterday. We'll dive into what it is next. You are locked on Nebraska, your daily Nebraska Cornhuskers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right. Thanks for making Locked On Nebraska your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Now through September 22nd, all customers of FanDuel can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Head to FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Okay, good Wednesday morning. We are making it through the week. I am Mitch Sherman of The Athletic. Connor Happer of 1620 The Zone in Omaha is with me. Connor, we have some brash talk from Nebraska on Tuesday. Mm. Not necessarily trash talk, but there's some brash talk. The Huskers met with the media as they do on Tuesdays of game week. We heard from coordinators Tony White and Marcus Satterfield and then a handful of Huskers including quarterback Dylan Raiola, but it was it was Makai Bayer, the linebacker, perhaps not your number one candidate to talk big, who said a few things about this upcoming Colorado-Nebraska game and the matchups. I think the most notable thing that he said was when Makai was asked about the physicality with which Nebraska intends to play. Let's just go ahead and listen to it, and then we'll have some thoughts. What kind of physical tone do you guys need to set against a team like that to, to, to send a message? Get them hard from the start. Kickoff. I'm going to be running down on kickoff. You see me down there. They're going to need two guys to block me. I want them to know that uh, that's how we coming down there. You're going to need you gotta have Tavion. You got Gage Snake. You got a lot of guys who come down there with a hot head, ready to attack everything. Um, this team is hungry. Uh, we put in a lot of work this offseason. We worked our tails off. For another team to come in here, think that they're going to run through us or it's going to be sweet. Uh, good luck to them. Wish them the best. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there we go. Now we're cooking. Yeah. That was, that was, uh, I don't know. How do you describe that? What do you feel like his tone was there? Uh, well, I think there's, you know, as we've talked about yesterday, I think there's a lot of confidence, um, you know, coming from that, that locker room. You don't get to, really see or hear it that much. Um, and I do think there's like a little saltiness about how it all went last year. I feel like they, you know, they, they now know that this is our last, this is our last shot at these guys. And, you know, we did not take advantage of an opportunity a year ago. And so it's like, yeah, the, the, we're not going to let this, this happen to us. So I think there's like this kind of last stand yeah. type of deal as well for that group. And Makai and, and you know, he's, He's he actually said a couple of things yesterday. Um, he was he was really getting going, and, and then you know, kind of just the, the 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 press conference just ended. So that might be uh, that might be the fireworks uh, that get us started or the spark that gets us started this week. I get the sense from him, and not as overtly from some others, but definitely from him. And I can I can I can piece it together. I think with some of the other the other stuff that we heard yesterday that some of the Nebraska players, the older players feel like they got played a little bit in Boulder last year. Like Colorado was able to, to win the psychological game by um, creating uh, this, this disrespect, this feeling of disrespect, whether it was from the Matt rule off season, we talked about all of this on the Tuesday show or the, uh, you know, the stepping on the field, the middle of the field at the beginning of the game. And, and they felt like, I think the Nebraska players feel like they got worked over a little bit. And they're not going to let Colorado do that this year. That if Colorado is going to feel disrespected, that Nebraska is going to come back. And and we haven't heard anything from Colorado players about that this year, to be sure. So this is Nebraska doing the talking here this year, both uh, it's coach on on Monday who didn't say much of anything at all. And then some players who did say a few things. But I feel like the the, the mindset from Nebraska this year is it's it's this is in our stadium. 
And if somebody's going to set the tone about the way this thing's going to yeah. go off the field, it's going to be us this time. I, you know what's interesting? I, I I watched all of Colorado's press conference yesterday, and they brought up one of their offensive linemen, and they brought up Deion Sanders, obviously. And and that was, I guess, all I said. It was an hour with there was only fifteen to twenty minutes worth of talking. Um, and and I felt like you know you just described Nebraska, I think, as a as a place that is really hungry, and not only hungry to get its program back, whatever, but like specifically hungry in the football program to beat Colorado. I, they were, you know, the player was asked about Nebraska and, you know, he wasn't here last year. He was actually at UTEP, one of their starting offensive linemen, um, coincidentally. And he was asked about Nebraska and, 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 and the, the quote that kind of got out there was, yeah, I'm not really worried about their defensive size up front. You know, it's just kind of technique and, um, you know, we're going to, if, if we do our job, then we should be able to do, do our job. I, I get the okay. sense that Colorado is, I don't know, maybe a little bit like, yeah, we beat these guys last year. So what's the problem? You know, probably we beat these guys last year and we're better that we think we're better than we were a year ago. So what's going to be the issue? I I don't, I don't really understand. And they can probably also look at what happened at Nebraska to Nebraska down the stretch last year and say, okay, they lost to Michigan state. They lost to Maryland. They lost to Wisconsin and Iowa you know, what's, what's the big deal? Like, so they talked, you know, they, they talked uh, about how they made strides in the off season. Every team talks about that. And yeah, they beat UTEP to open the season. Like it's UTEP. I, I would think that if I was in Colorado's position, I was a player there. I'd probably be, be look, that's the way you probably need to look at it. Like you're not buying into the hype about Nebraska if you're a player at Colorado. So I totally get that, that mindset from them. From our point of view, I think we can see, especially when it comes to something like the strength and size of Nebraska's defensive line, he might be barking up the wrong tree on that one. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe Colorado's O-line is going to handle the Nebraska defensive line just fine. I will believe that when I see it. I think that Ty Robinson and Nash Hutmacher and Jamari Butler are going to have their way with Colorado up front. Does that mean Nebraska is going to win the game because of it? No, Shadur might still throw for 400 yards. But I don't think Colorado is going to win that battle at the line of scrimmage. And I think they will come out of that game believing that Nebraska is much better up front than what they're going into it thinking. Yeah, I just I just got that sense from them yesterday that and this was even said just kind of and people say this all the time, but like, yeah, can we've been there, you know, we, we, we've been there, done that. We've seen, um, you know, big time environment. It's like, I don't know that you have. And, and so mm-hmm. you really think about it. Um, you know, Oregon, I think got it juiced up for them last year. There was, you know, and they got absolutely stomped out and at Austin yeah. stadium last year. Um, but in the PAC 12, I just don't know if you're going to see anything like what you're going to see on Saturday from an environment perspective. And then you add in the football part too, from the physicality perspective and what Nebraska is trying to do to you. And now this added wrinkle of like having a really good quarterback, it probably changes things for Nebraska as well. So I, I don't know. I, I just, it, it just felt like, man, they, they saw what they saw last year. They saw what they needed to see. And, and that's what they think of Nebraska right now. And I, you know, for Nebraska fans, they are probably hoping, okay, keep thinking that because it's not a different, it, it's, it's not the same thing this year. This is a very, this is a silly question and it's, it's a this answer is subjective. So there's not like a right answer or a wrong answer, but I was, I was writing this earlier in the week about the environment that we expect at Memorial Stadium and you know, kind of compared it to what the Buffs saw last year when they went on the road to Oregon and Utah were clearly their two most hostile um, road venues. And I, I suggested, I believe that Memorial Stadium on Saturday night is going to be a different challenge than what yeah. Colorado saw at Outson and in Salt Lake City. But I don't know. Um, wh- what do you think? Because Oregon is Oregon is no joke. Like going into Oregon to play, yeah, it's not eighty six thousand, but it doesn't necessarily always matter how many people are there. It's how loud it is and how much it echoes and reverberates, and whether they're right on top of you. And I think Oregon has a decent reputation of being a hostile place to play, and they were angry. Like, let's make no mistake. We talk about Nebraska and and Makai Bear with those words. I think there's some anger in there. Oregon was angry last year when CU came to town at 3-0, and and that was 
that was that was um, illustrated very much by the pregame speech that Dan Lanning gave in that hmm. game about how Colorado's little run stops right now, and yeah, it did. It, they're it, playing it did. for clicks, and we're playing for yeah. wins. Um, yeah. That was that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say, I don't. What you're going to see from Nebraska's environment on Saturday cannot be surpassed in college football. It it okay. does not get better than that. It will it it will not get better than that. It might be on the same level as that somewhere, and maybe Oregon is one of those places. But when Nebraska's when Nebraska's going, um, and their fans feel some type of way about the opponents. Uh, it it does not get better than that, and I'm talking about anywhere. Uh, that I, I really believe that. Yeah, I I mean I've been around the SEC, and you know I think you have to start there if you're going to make comparisons, and of course some other places in the Big Ten. I mean, there's no doubt that Penn State and Ohio State, you know, Michigan probably doesn't quite have that reputation, even even though it's the biggest stadium, no. it's not the most hostile. No. Um, I you know I think LSU. Uh, and I've been there for an afternoon game. Uh, so it wasn't the same as playing at night there. And Nebraska's Nebraska's close. Nebraska's in the, in the conversation for sure. And if there's, there hasn't been a game since Miami in 2014 where exactly. the stadium was going to be juiced in the way That's that it is I'm on Saturday. About. I'm not talking about like an every Saturday thing. Obviously, yeah. you know, there's a bunch of venues that are probably better. Um, but you know, when, when it's, when you get this game and the last time they had it was, you know, almost 10 years ago to the date. Um, yeah, it, it's it, it's unrivaled probably. Yeah. Yeah. And Nebraska fans, they, uh, you know, they got they got a little a little push. They got a little push from Matt Rule in his, with his comments on Monday about save your Nebraska nice for Sunday. Let's go out there and be loud. Let's impact the game. You know, let's make it difficult for for Colorado to be able to hear in the headset for Shadur Sanders to be able to get his his words from from uh, the press box and then from Makai Bear on Tuesday, it's building. Now the, the anger is, is building. We're not going to hear from Nebraska again until, until Thursday when Matt rule talks. So that might be the, uh, the end of it, but um, it's going to be building very much until kickoff on Saturday night. So can't wait to, uh, to follow, follow along with that. Uh, when we come back after the break, we're going to lighten it up a little bit and talk about <laughs> Dylan Raiola and what his offensive coordinator thought of the freshman quarterback's performance in the opener. Um, also want to remind you that if you're watching us on YouTube today, please subscribe, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button. Um, that helps in, helps bring in uh, more people to see the show. Uh, and on all of the podcast listening apps, don't forget to subscribe, leave us a rating. You can also email us at lockedonneb at gmail.com. We will have a mailbag show for you on Thursday, along with our predictions for week two. Um, that's to come next after the break. Time for some Dylan Rayola talk. All right, passion, drive, and patience. That's the winning formula, and it's also what keeps your car, your ride or die alive because eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. They've got superchargers. They have a rack, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights. You need all of that stuff, whether you're into power, speed, or style eBay Motors has got you covered because they've got more than 122 million parts. Big number for your number one ride or die. You will always find exactly what you're looking for. And with the eBay guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. All right, welcome back. Uh, one, before, we'll transition into the Dylan Raiola talk with another thing that Makai Bayer had to say yesterday. Oh, oh, um, Makai Bayer. Yeah, let's thank you, Makai Bayer, for sparking the conversation today here on the Locked On Nebraska podcast. So, uh, he was asked if, you know, if preparing for Shadur Sanders becomes easier because they see Dylan Raiola on a day-to-day -day basis in practice, and he kind of bought and he said, "Well, don't you know? Don't compare those guys. You can't compare Dylan Raiola to Shadur Sanders. They're Dylan's a dog, um, and you know, kind of went off on on his own thing here." Um, 
So do you have any comment on that part first? I think that seems a bit inflammatory. In the mm-hmm. first the, the, the first Makai Bayer comment that we discussed in this show, I think that was genuine. I think that was some some frustration, um, some feelings related to the game last year. This one, I think he's looking for a reaction a bit. <laughs> I think he believes that about Dylan, that Dylan is a dog. But look, Shadur Sanders is legit, man, and he's proven it. Like he threw for 3,200 yards last year. 27 touchdowns, three picks. Rayola's has played in one college game. So he might be great. And down the road, I think it could be a an appropriate comparison. Yeah. It probably isn't an appropriate comparison right now, but not for the reason that Makai Bayer suggested. It's not an appropriate comparison because you don't have the sample size with Dylan Raiola yeah. to go out and compare what he's done to Shadur Sanders, who's one of the best quarterbacks in college football. A hundred percent. Maybe you'll maybe you'll look at it in five years and you'll be like, "Wow, Makai Bear really saw something there. He was right." Mm-hmm. You know, Dylan ended up being a better or whatever it might might have been. But uh, yeah, sample size is an important thing right now. So um, that was that was definitely sort of interesting and. Um, Another piece that, but at that point, that was the last question in Makai Bear's media availability. He was cooking mm-hmm. to your point. He was, he would have <laughs> ripped off probably five more minutes or whatever you asked him. Um, and uh, they, uh, they cut, they cut it off. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. They stepped in, they stepped in, and, and these things are done in the, so this was like an off to the side interview. Mm-hmm. Um, the setup, we like to share this stuff with you guys sometimes like the setup. There's the main interview room where Matt rule and the coordinators and Dylan Raiola and some others come into Jamari Butler was in there. Um, Isaac Gifford was in there. Ty Robinson on Tuesday. And then, and then they go into the, into the Hawks championship center playing field. And there's a couple of tables, stages, small stages set up in there. One-on-one interviews can take place in there. And Makai was on the side in there. Nebraska tapes all of this and sends it out. So they sent out this Makai Bear interview. They 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 spread it to the world, um, which good for them um, because yeah. there were only about five or six people around him when he said this stuff, and then a whole lot more people <laughs> saw it because Nebraska put it out in the email. Um, it, so it's meant to be yeah. a little less formal um, and yeah. you know a little more conversational, and it was for yeah. for Makai Bear. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. So so let's talk about this Dylan thing. Um, he's get his matchup with Shadur Sanders is going to be front and center. And there's going to be a lot more attention on Riola this week than there was even last week in front of his collegiate debut. You've got NBC sports in town came in on Tuesday. Um, my, uh, fantastic former colleague at the athletic, Nicole Auerbach fan of the show, by the way, she, oh. uh, she mentioned to, uh, to me yesterday that she listens to this pod and it's very informative. So, um, Fist bump, Nicole. Put it in a good job. Quote, informative from <laughs> Nicole Auerbach. <laughs> yes. She's here for a couple days, um, and she'll be spending some time with Dylan Raiola and some others, and can't wait to see how that's going to all look in NBC's pregame coverage on Saturday. Um, there will be more national media coverage, I'm sure, of Dylan Raiola um, this week, too. You know, He's at the center of things. He's going to be featured prominently um, all around this game. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, we saw how he handled game one. It's going to be interesting to see how he handles some of this stuff. I, I suspect that he's going to be fine because he looked fine Gosh. on the stage Saturday and again, Tuesday. Yeah, I, I think so too. And I mean, there's some, there's some stuff in there as you go back and look. And I, I tweeted out a clip this morning. Uh, there was a all 22 view that one of the draft mm-hmm. scouts got, and they're already watching this guy. He's the way he's able to do things that are just so advanced already in his first college game, like in the first quarter of his first college game, uh-huh. move people with his eyes and make checks yes. and stuff like that. It's um, it's pretty unbelievable. And then, of course, he has the supreme arm talent, the ability to get the ball in places where he wants to put it to. He's I mean, he's. He's very, very good. And the best part about it is right now for Nebraska, he's very advanced. So you can trust him in situations like this to not get too over his skis. I watched that clip that you tweeted out and you know, you, you put it out with the question of whether he's even better than we thought. 
And what did you, so I had, I had a very specific observation about that throw. This was, I think it was from the first quarter. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Um, it may not have been, but it was an intermediate throw where he stood in the pocket, went through some progressions and then hit, was it banks? Um, who he I hit believe, on, no. yeah, on, um, maybe a 15 yard gain. What did you, so I, I remember that play watching that play live and I had a thought and my thought was probably jaded somewhat by recent past Nebraska quarterback um, play. But what did you think when you watched that play back on the on the film? What stood out to you? There's like seven things. First, the the route that he ended up completing is a route that you only run when you have a quarterback who you feel like can handle it because it's a it's a it's a soft kind of zone where the, where the safeties are kind of playing over the top and they don't want to get beat deep. Now there might've been an option to push it way downfield at, at one point during that play, but it's, you know, the, the receiver who caught it just kind of sat in and he, he settled in and Raiola threw it before he got into his break before he got like, before he mm -hmm. settled in and then he kind of, you know, moves people with his eyes. I thought for a second that he actually made the throw while looking at somebody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, and, and he's got that stuff in his bag. So there was like eight things just uh, where, where we look at things as like a simple, this is a simple completion. That's a simple throw. How does he make it look so easy? It's all the stuff he does before he throws it. That's how he makes it look so easy. When I watched it live, I thought it was going to get picked because he threw it into a pocket in the zone over an outside linebacker. And I thought, and I think again, this was this is this is me having watched Nebraska quarterbacks over the years, recent years. And I think a little subtle difference there, and that ball does get picked, but he froze the linebacker um, with the way that he went through his progressions, and as you said, with his eyes. And it was quite a bit out of reach. Like he had to put it where he had to put it to make yeah. the completion, but it wasn't really a dangerous throw. It just looked to me like it was dangerous when he threw it because there was a linebacker in the area. Now, if that's a different linebacker who's an all American, like when they play Iowa at, at the end of the season, he may not be able to move that guy and he may not be able to, to even attempt that throw because that linebacker could be in the way of the path to the receiver. But it was masterful, I think, if I'm watching it right, with what Dylan did to freeze that guy, move him a little bit, and then expose that spot in the zone. I'm thinking about former and any former Nebraska quarterback um, of the last few years where you know you get into that situation, you feel like you got a guy on the hook, and he's, you know, you got a receiver open and you know who to throw it to. And then the last thing you have to do is make the throw and execute the throw. And at that moment, you're like, I got him. It's panic time, you know, and yeah. he might try to laser one in and it's intercepted by the linebacker. Um, so, yeah, he's 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 got all the tools in the toolbox for sure. I, I can't wait. I think it's a great national stage for for Riola. Like Nebraska can almost use Colorado's popularity. You know, at the beginning of of, of Dylan Rail, uh, Dylan Rayola, uh Deion Sanders press conference yesterday one of the things that he mentioned just when he was going through his list of things that he wanted to get out there was their television viewers and how they had over 4 million people watch their game against North Dakota state and stuff like that. Nebraska can kind of use Colorado's platform as a bit of a springboard. And mm -hmm. I think specifically Dylan Raiola's uh, can, he can use Shador Sanders platform as a springboard for this game yeah. as well. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. Let's come back and, and continue this conversation. We'll get into some recruiting talk also in the third segment, but um, when we come back, something that Marcus Satterfield had to say about Dylan Rayola that was really interesting. That's next. All right, it's Tapper here for the FanDuel Sportsbook. You've heard us talk about FanDuel. Um, sports are back, guys, and they're so back that the NFL is back this weekend as well. And here is yes. the added bonus for you all this week. Now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers, but specifically you, can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. So with your YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon at a market game. All you need is that Google account and a current form of payment. You can cancel the trial at any time. Three weeks free of Sunday ticket. You get every game in the afternoon window. It is amazing. I am taking advantage of this. $5 bet. That's all it takes with the FanDuel Sportsbook. 
All you have to do is head to FanDuel.com slash locked on. Download America's number one sports book. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Okay, final segment. We got a few minutes left, and I don't want to miss out on playing this from Marcus Satterfield, what he had to say when he was asked about Dylan Raiola on Tuesday at Nebraska's media availability. Just the operation, the rhythm of the offense, and taking care of the football. And he did all three of those. I thought he, you know, he, again, talking about a culture of excellence. I mean, he was prepared. He knew exactly where the ball needed to go. He was accurate with the ball, took care of the ball. Uh, you know, I was just, I was just really, uh, excited to see it because I knew you know coming up that tunnel walk that was a lot of years and a lot of memories and a lot of days of of anticipation and excitement and I was hoping that he was going to be able to come out and just play you know and, and just play like he does and you get nervous sometimes that a young guy gets and tries to do too much and it's just too 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 emotional and he was like a freaking surgeon like it was amazing to see him just his maturity uh you know way way beyond his years from that standpoint what stands that, out to you about that? I mean, that's the main takeaway from from the game. It's obviously the throws that he made, but I mean, to handle the emotional pieces, we talked about the little, you know, huddle with the with the with Nebraska's first family, the Riolas before the game. And, you know, I think they they showed him on TV taking that deep breath before he walked onto the field. But once he did that, it was like, Yep, I'm here. This is this is my team. This is football. This is like what I've been trained to do my entire life. And Marcus Satterfield's not talking about like a surgeon like, you know, dicing up the defense. He's talking about the steady hand in which he uses his scalpel with, you know, like that's, uh -huh. that's, that's what he's talking about. And that is the, by far the most impressive thing. I can't wait to see what he adds in terms of the throws and the arm talent and all that stuff, but like how far he is along in terms of just operating is unbelievable to watch. I think he's talking about it kind of like this, Connor. Thank you, Weird Al. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just I just thought it was great that he went with like a freaking surgeon. Like, like freaking we hear from Satterfield all the time, and he's kind of dry, and he kind of, you know, drones on a little bit. It's always more exciting when Tony White talks. Um, I don't know why. Nothing against Sat. Like, Sat's a football coach, and sometimes he's not that interesting to, to listen to. And Tony's personality, like, he gets into it. Like, he comes in and... And he's 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 kind of pumped up, but then sat every once in a while will drop something like that. He's like a freaking surgeon. So um, thank you, Marcus Satterfield, and thank you, Weird Al, for being able to contribute to our show um, today on this Wednesday. Yeah, it's appreciated. Um, it, it got kind of got me in a Weird Al rabbit hole as I was uh, as I was looking at some things this morning. But uh, we we digress. Recruiting. So um, Nebraska has decided to leave the door open for several people, it turns out. There's got to be a parody song in there um, <laughs> as well. So uh, not only are they getting Michael Terry to, to visit this weekend, the five-star athlete from the San Antonio area, um, it, he's that's been confirmed for a couple weeks by multiple recruiting outlets. Um, they're also getting a couple people that are committed already that Nebraska was after in the 2025 class, and they are still after. Dawson Merritt from the Kansas City area, uh, he committed to Alabama. It was kind of a two-horse race there. He decided, I think I'd like to go to the game this weekend, and Nebraska is allowing him to do that. Same thing with Cortez Mills uh, out of the Miami area. He is committed to Oklahoma at the moment. Nebraska was in on that recruitment, and he has decided, I think I'd like to go to the game this weekend, and Nebraska has left that door open for him. A lot of guys who are commits to the class already, and a lot of guys who are going to be highly, highly rated recruits going forward beyond the 25 class. So, I mean, this is Nebraska's biggest home game of the year. There's no doubt about it. And it's their best opportunity to get guys on campus, and they are absolutely loading up. Yeah, Jackson Cantwell, the number one offensive tackle in the 2026 class. He's like the David Sanders for next year. He's coming in. That's a kid out of uh, Nixa, Missouri, who has been talking to Donovan Raiola for quite some time. So they've developed a relationship. And then Brandon Arrington, um, who's been to Lincoln, the five-star athlete from Southern California, is coming back for this class too. He's a 2026 also. But yeah, I mean, 
the uh, the fact that Nebraska is getting Dawson Merritt to come back and then Cortez Mills, um, you know, you you probably I think can read more into Dawson Merritt. I I don't know. I mean, Cortez Mills, a guy from Miami, uh, maybe he's going to see the impact that Vincent Shavers and Corey Barney and Amari Sanders and others are making early in their career at Nebraska, careers at Nebraska, and um, be uh, intrigued by that. But I'd say Dawson Merritt because he is, you know, semi-local. Um, you can yeah. make the drive to Nebraska very easily. Um, he is the son um, of the uh, the Chiefs DBs coach, uh, Dave Merritt. So um, interesting for sure. If Nebraska steals Dawson Merritt from Alabama, it, we can play um, Eat It by Weird <laughs> Al um, in, <laughs> for the, uh, the Locked On um, Alabama uh, listeners. Nice. I just, I, I like the idea that, you know, it, what did he commit to Alabama? Probably about a month or so ago, maybe beginning of August and end, end of July. Um, it was mm-hmm. it was over the summer. Nebraska was locked in a, in a recruiting battle there, and it never felt like oh, you know, like we're gonna sulk about this one. It was like, yeah, why don't you go ahead and commit to Alabama? That's cool. Um, we'll see you at the Colorado game. <laughs> you know, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. sure. So I, I think Nebraska always knew that they were going to have one more crack at this thing, or maybe multiple more cracks at this thing. And, and I, I, you know, that's the confidence in which they, they recruit probably. And that's the power of this game too. It's yeah. really important. That's the thing. This game, part of the reason this game is so big and we've gone over all the reasons, but part of the reason this game is so big is because it sets Nebraska on a trajectory one way or the other with the program. This is the, this is the, the bellwether game out of Matt rules. It's his, it's his 14th game. Um, th- it's the first time where there's like a real barometer that's, that's coming into play. And this is going to determine in the eyes of a lot of people, including recruits, like what kind of a path Nebraska is, is on. And if it wins and it looks good and the, the atmosphere is wild, then players like Dawson Merritt and Cortez mills and these 2026 five stars are going to look at Nebraska in a different way. And somebody else who might look at Nebraska in a different way, who was at the first game, I don't believe he's scheduled to come to this one, is Christian Jones, the Omaha West Side linebacker. But you can bet that he's going to be paying attention. And he's got a, a commitment date coming up here. The bet the best remaining uncommitted player in the state of Nebraska, maybe the best po- prospect in the state of Nebraska in this 2025 class. But Christian Jones, along with everybody who who is in attendance on Saturday night, um, th- the feel that they get from yep. watching Nebraska, Colorado is going to determine a lot of things about how these next couple of classes shape up for Matt rule and his staff. Only two more shows left to discuss it. Uh, we'll get to some predictions and mailbag tomorrow. So you can get your questions to us at, uh, locked on any at gmail.com. Please email us or find us on Twitter, or, uh, you know, make a comment on the show. We'll go ahead and search those out and, and we'll get you know how to get a hold of us. Yeah, yeah, we, we're we're available. Um, and then we'll get out there and uh, and do our last pod on Friday. Uh, a few thank yous to throw out today. First of all, thank you to Weird Al. Appreciate that. That's Absolutely. for being part of the show. And thank you for making Locked On Nebraska your first listen today. Now you can go check out the Locked On College Football Podcast. Plenty of things getting you ready for the season as we get into it as well. The Locked On College Football Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.